Let's go ahead and cover our next plant list. This is plant list 2B. And uh, the, the broad category here is monocots that are not grasses. So a monocot is, when we think about them, we think about grasses or palm trees or uh, plants that are related to those. And it's a pretty general category. So we're gonna cover some monocots today that are not grasses. Now, I also just pick plants that are blooming right now and that are common in the landscape. I've got a whole method that I use to determine which plant is important to study at the right time. And then I kind of pick the category afterwards. So a lot of our plants were monocots and then I found two more and there we go, there's our 10. So you kind of have to stretch it a little bit sometimes. But these are all important plants in our landscape. They're ones that you should be able to recognize. And I think it'll help to round out all of the plants we've talked about so far. So here we go with plant list 2B, non-grass monocots. So first on our list is agave. Agave Americana, commonly called century plant. Notice the agave is in the asparagaceae, asparagus family. Now take a look at these photos and hopefully my face is not covering up one of them, but uh, notice that flower stalk on the right hand side. You can see uh, two images. One is the bottom one is the flower stalk before it opens. Does it look like something familiar? Looks like a giant asparagus. And then as the flower opens, you get the image on the top right. And so that's part of what puts these plants in the asparagus family. They used to have their own family and uh, taxonomists recently said, you know what? These are like asparagus. So there we go. Agave, there's many, many different types. They are all native to North America. Some of them are native to San Diego. We've got two native species in San Diego County on the coast and in the desert. And one of the most commonly planted agaves is the century plant, agave americana. This is a very large agave. And a lot of people say don't plant it anymore because it gets huge, it spreads everywhere. And it's kind of part of the more traditional old school landscape. In fact, this plant is part of a kind of a very traditional Spanish colonial theme, perhaps. You can imagine the red clay roofs and the white walls and the agave. Agave has been a very important plant for the people of North America for a very, very long time and uh, has produced some form of a food source, although you cannot eat this plant raw. It's uh, quite toxic if you try to eat it. In fact, there is an infamous video of a woman trying to teach herbalism on YouTube, and she's teaching you about eating aloe vera, and she's holding up agave. And so she takes a bite on camera, and thinking that it's aloe vera, but she has misidentified the species and she bites into agave and she has a medical emergency on camera. And then somehow like it was published live to the internet and it's kind of a viral video, but it's also a very good lesson. Do not eat something if you don't know what it is and make sure you are good at identifying because it's a very fine detail sometimes that makes the difference between food and poison. But from the agave, we can get food. We get the agave nectar, uh, which usually comes from a very specific species, uh, not the agave americana necessarily. And then of course we get tequila, the alcohol fermented. Traditionally, the, the plant itself has been a valuable um, not just food source, but a valuable fiber source and water source, building material. There's all sorts of different 
traditional uses of the plant that are uh, worth exploring. The common name, century plant, is uh, part of a myth. And the myth is that it blooms once every 100 years. Well, that's not the case. Uh, this plant blooms once in its life, that's true, but every 10 to 30 years or so. So up to 30 years, and then it sends up that flower spike, which then blooms. And at the end of that, the plant will die. Although many times it will send up clones, little pups around the base, and you can dig them out and you can replant them. And so even though it dies after it blooms, it uh, can very easily live on. This plant is prized for its foliage color or the gray green or bluish color that you can see on the agave Americana. They can grow to be quite large and quite wide. So uh, typically they're about six feet tall, six feet wide, although they can get larger in the right conditions and can get up to 10 feet. And that's the actual plant that I'm talking about. When it sends up the flowers, the flower spike, it can go to 25 feet, 30 feet tall. So quite a stunning feature in the landscape. Oftentimes they're planted in a line, like along a road, a little, say you had a long driveway going into a property, then you can plant the agave in a line along that promenade. Sometimes right on the outside of a fence or a wall, they're kind of uh, valued in, in, uh, in a row. They are good for security because they have a very sharp spine at the end of the leaf and the whole thing's a little bit toothed and spiky. So you, you're not gonna walk through it, but uh, a lot of people plant these too close together. They do not give them the space they need to grow. And once they're big, they're hard to remove. So uh, if you put it in the wrong place, you're gonna have yourself a, a inconvenient problem. And so make sure if you do plant one of these, you give it plenty of space. Being a succulent from North America, uh, found out in arid and desert habitats, this would be a very low water use plant, obviously, something you don't need to give any irrigation at all and does just fine here in our climate. And actually in nature, uh, this is found as a, um, this is found under oak forest. So kind of a scrubby chaparral type habitat that has some of the oak trees getting into an oak woodland. You'll find this agave growing underneath oak trees, which kind of conjures a very iconic image of uh, the old Mexican ranches. And so it can grow in a field all on its own in full sun, but uh, in nature you find it in and amongst trees and shrubs. So this plant would be right at home in any Mediterranean garden. It's happy on the coast. Uh, it, it gives a nice uh, focal point. It's an item of interest in a garden. Definitely has a unique characteristic and quite an iconic shape and size. In the right place, this plant is beautiful. Although be careful because you need to give it plenty of room to grow. And so if you are going to select one of our North American agaves, this is one of the first ones you may consider. Agave Americana century plant. And next up we have another agave species. This is the foxtail agave, agave attenuata. And this one is quite unique among all of the agaves because it is soft. It does not have any spines or thorns and the leaves themselves are very uh, soft and gentle. So it's a, it's a good one for the landscape because it's excellent right along pathways, sidewalks, borders, and things like that. Quite common in San Diego and coastal Southern California. Although originally it comes from Western and Central Mexico a little bit further south. It's called the foxtail agave as a common name because check out those flowers on the left-hand photo. Uh, notice how they kind of 
all go up and then curl over. It looks like, a, I guess it looks like a fox's tail. So that's the flower spike. And instead of this plant just flowering once and then dying, it tends to form this clonal group. So uh, it fills in and you get multiple rosettes in a single space. And the flower can be cut once it is spent. And this patch of foxtail agave will persist in the environment for a long time. It's much, much smaller than agave americana. It uh, typically is about two feet tall, three feet tall at the maximum, although it can spread like along a hillside or a bank and it can tend to look a little bit larger, but usually two to three feet is where you see it. Because it is so soft, uh, you don't pose a risk of growing it right next to a building or right next to a sidewalk. And if it starts to creep out into the sidewalk too much, you come along and just chop it off and it will regrow itself quite easily. It's very tolerant of pruning. So you can do quite a drastic pruning job and within a very short time, it will grow back. The, the plant we see here is the standard species. It's kind of a minty green in color, but there are cultivars as well. And uh, sometimes people look out for the variegated cultivar that has kind of the yellow and white stripes mixed in with this green color. And that's kind of a nice one. A lot of the agaves that we have in our landscape that are cultivars or even hybrids use this as one of their parents because it has so many traits that are really valuable for the garden being, of course, drought tolerant, but then soft, easy to prune, very tidy, long lived and persistent. Naturally, this agave grows on volcanic rock cliff faces, and it can be within pine forest in uh, the mountains of Mexico, which is tropical but dry. So when you bring it up to Southern California, we are subtropical, meaning we don't freeze, but we're also dry. So it get, we can get away with growing this plant in our area perfectly, even though it's not technically from uh, the, the Mediterranean climate. It's more of like a cloud forest type of a plant. So just like the agave americana, this one has that kind of sculptural look and is prized for its unique look and our aesthetic. A lot of times it's planted uh, to give kind of a tropical effect because it has large green leaves. The books will say it's resistant to deer and other animals eating it. But uh, I used to have this in a house I lived in and the neighbors had goats. The goats would sometimes come over into my backyard and they would always run up and eat this plant first because there's no uh, spikes on it. So it may be re resistant to deer, but it is not resistant to goats. And I don't know uh, if it's good for the goats, but goats are pretty good at eating almost anything. So I'm sure it wasn't too harmful if they chose to eat it. So be careful if you've got goats. So in general, if you're comparing the two agaves, uh, you would probably be best to select this one over agave americana. This one's more appropriate for most applications, although in the right setting with plenty of space. And if you're looking for that classic look, the agave americana is also quite a beautiful plant in our landscape. But uh, here we go with our second agave, agave attenuata, foxtail agave. And now let's take a look at the aloe. All of the agaves come from North America and all of the aloes come from Africa. And so sometimes Northern Africa or Southern Africa, but most of them from South Africa. Well, and they look similar to each other and people often get them confused. And in fact, they can possibly hybridize, but uh, do not get them confused because if you treat them the same, you may have problems. So the aloe arborescens, torch aloe, sometimes called uh, tree aloe, although there are many things referred to as tree aloe. So don't get it confused. Torch aloe is more often the common name that we see in Southern California. 
is one of the excellent choices in the garden. This one forms a really nice backdrop. It'll get quite tall and you get lots of rosettes on a single plant. Notice the image on the right-hand side, how it has long leaves. There are some very soft teeth on the margins of the leaves and they are not, uh, not terribly spiky or thorny, but it tends to grow together in this uh, dense clump, which can be quite tall and quite broad. It can spread. So this makes a really nice hedge or a backdrop along a fence or a border. And around this time, they start to bloom. They'll send up the uh, flower spikes with a deep red to a coral, orangish color. And they look like torches. So they're very large, large shaped and kind of a cone shaped. So you end up with quite an attractive appearance with the bluish green leaves and then the orange red flowers. Obviously, this would be a, an attracting flower to a hummingbird because they like the red tubular flowers. In nature, this one has quite a broad range. It goes from uh, South Africa, the, the country, all the way up through the tropics on the continent. And so it can tolerate the Mediterranean climate just fine, but also can do a little bit more of a humid environment where there's more rain in the summertime. And so it's, uh, it's appropriate for a broad range of conditions and it can even be a little bit cold hardy as well. Because it is so variable in its natural habitat, it is, uh, it is applicable to a broad range of uses all the way from the coast up to uh, any kind of place you're looking for the tropical effect in Southern California. Uh, it's good for privacy and screens. It's good next to uh, water features and uh, it has a lot of value in the landscape. The only thing to consider is it does get large. And so if you're not prepared to prune it back, you would want to uh, not select this plant for anything that's in close quarters right next to a walkway or uh, along a wall or a fence could potentially bring problems. And interestingly, this plant in South Africa has a lot of ethnobotanic history. Uh, this was one of the main plants used in the fencing of the indigenous settlements of South Africa. So often there would be houses arranged in a circle or a square. And in the middle is where everyone kind of spent their day. And then around that would be a fence, a living fence of plant material. And that plant material would usually be thorny or spiky. And the goal of the fence was to keep the cattle in and to keep the predators out. And this plant in particular is one of the species that was planted to form that living fence. And you can still find evidence of former house sites and village sites based on the existing torch aloe. And based on its planting patterns, it provides evidence of a settlement, even though the actual settlement may be gone a long time ago. The name of this type of a living fence is crawl. So in South Africa, it's referred to as crawl, which has the same Latin roots as the Spanish word corral, which is corral is a fence used to keep in livestock. Uh, so the word does not come to English directly from South Africa but it comes to both countries from Spain and Portugal. Kind of interesting history there. Well, there you have it, a wonderful plant, aloe arborescence, torch aloe. And next up, we have a very common plant, aloe vera. And here we'll use the common name medicinal aloe for aloe vera. Although a lot of people just say, aloe vera. Again, this is in the same family as our other aloe, but notice where this one originates. This one comes from northern Oman, 
And in particular, it has a very narrow native range. It comes from the desert mountains up in the North African, kind of the Sinai Peninsula, very close to Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. But this comes from Oman. So not South Africa at all. And notice how different this plant looks, medicinal aloe. So uh, you may find red or yellow flowers based on different cultivated varieties. But the traditional genuine species has a yellow flower that you can see rising up in the left-hand photo. Notice the leaves of this plant, how much more fleshy they look. That's because aloe vera is known for its mucilaginous gel that's inside the leaf. So you can cut that open and then apply that to skin for burns and it provides a soothing effect. And it can be even eaten internally, although there is some uh, warnings provided by the FDA because they don't necessarily recognize that as a proper nutritional supplement and they recognize there may be some problems that go along with using aloe vera as a food. Although you can find it in many health food stores and you can find beverages made out of aloe vera as well. So uh, medicinally, this has a lot of importance for skin applying to burns. And because of that, it has been spread all over the world even though in its native range, it's a very small area that it comes from. Aloe vera is very good in containers, in pots. So a lot of people keep a pot of aloe vera, can have it as a house plant even, keep it indoors and it works just fine. And some people will have a pot right outside of their front door or next to their garden. And anytime you have a sunburn, you go and you clip a leaf and there you go. You can uh, scrape out some of the material, apply it to your skin and give yourself a little bit of a soothing feeling if you've got a sunburn. It's very easy to propagate that way too. You can take that cutting and then replant it. And now you've got extra aloe vera. In fact, this plant will grow by clones and the clump that it's in will continue to expand. And so you do a good job when you actually are pulling off these pups, we call them, or clones. And that helps to keep the actual plant that you put in the ground where you planted it. It also helps to keep it thriving and looking very nice. So, Aloe vera works just fine as an outdoor plant in San Diego, and it's planted mainly for its culinary and its medicinal uses, not as much for its landscape or ornamental use, but it has a lot of aesthetic as value as well. So look at those uh, beautiful yellow flowers and notice the, the leaves themselves, very charismatic and characteristic. When you compare this to the torch aloe, this one is much smaller. So uh, with the flowers, it's about three or four feet tall. Oftentimes though, if it's planted on flat ground, the leaves by themselves will only be one or two feet tall. So more of a ground cover or like a foreground planting right next to a pathway is really good. Uh, it does just fine in a succulent garden, although it needs a little bit more water than a true desert plant in our region would need. And so oftentimes some partial shade works well for this plant and helps it to be nice and green and very fleshy, as opposed to the full sun can cause it to tinge red a little bit and be a little bit dried up or desiccated. So if you give it a little extra water, if you give it a little bit of a shady spot, this plant will typically look its best. As with all of our succulent species, aloe vera does not tolerate frost or snow very well. So it's good for dry areas, excellent for uh, rock gardens. 
but it does well all through the tropics as well. So you'll see this as a popular plant grown right into the equatorial rainforest countries. It's relatively resistant to pests. There's not really many animals in the garden that will eat this plant, uh, although it may get some uh, mealybugs or aphids. Usually it's not bad enough to hurt the plant. You can get uh, a couple of different variations. These are natural variations. And so uh, they're not cultivars, but some of them cause spots on the leaves. So every now and then uh, you'll find aloe vera with spots on the leaves. And that is a particular variation that some people look for when they plant this plant. So as always, I'm not a doctor, nor am I an herbologist. So I recommend caution and I do not give you any recommendations or prescriptions for how to work with plants, especially if you're going to consume them. This is a plant that people eat. They eat it as uh, a fresh vegetable. They'll harvest the gel and turn that into kind of a dessert. And the juice is also consumed. But there's some evidence that that could possibly be problematic, especially if you're taking other medication. So I don't recommend you do that unless you talk to a doctor, but there's no evidence that using this plant as an ointment to soothe you on the outside of your skin, that won't cause any problems. And so you can feel very safe uh, applying this on the outside of your skin and hoping to get a little bit of a relief from a sunburn. But remember, do not get this confused with agave. If you put agave juice on your skin, it will cause a rash and you will be in pain. If you put aloe juice on your skin, it will soothe the rash and it will relieve your pain. So you must know your ID. So here we have aloe vera, medicinal aloe. And next up, we have Alstroemeria aurea, the Peruvian lily. Now, a lot of times people just call these Alstroemeria and they don't even worry about the species name because there's so many varieties, cultivated varieties with their own names. So all these colors we see here, these are all different named varieties, cultivars of Alstroemeria. But if we're gonna look for an actual original species, it'll be Alstroemeria aurea. And this comes from uh, obviously the Peruvian area and it has a broad range all the way from Chile to Argentina. So it's in South America, which is another Mediterranean climate. And I think maybe more than any other, this plant, you would never expect it to be a monocot or related to grass. It doesn't look anything like grass. Look at that beautiful flower. And you can observe some of the leaves in these photos. If you have the chance on the right-hand side to take a look at the photo, you'll notice the parallel veination. So the veins of the leaves are all going in the same direction, parallel. That's the clue that it's a monocot, even though it doesn't necessarily look grass-like in any way. Alstroemeria is a very popular garden plant. It's quite hardy in our region. It's very drought tolerant. Part of the reason this plant is so drought tolerant is that it grows from a cluster of tubers, kind of like potatoes, underground. So this is a swollen uh, section of the stem that uh, stores water and allows the plant to regrow year after year, even when cut to the ground. That fact makes this plant very popular in the cut flower industry, as well as in our traditional landscapes. The, the very stunning flower in both its pattern and its colors is great in floral arrangements and it's very easy to acquire because growers, as a perennial, growers can 
uh, cut and this plant will keep popping up year after year. It'll do the same in your garden as well. In fact, a lot of uh, organic farmers, vegetable growers, they like to plant some Alstroemeria in the Mediterranean regions like California in and around your vegetable beds because this is a very hardy flower that you don't have to do much to in order to keep it around. And the flowers will attract some of the beneficial insects that will go after your uh, vegetable pests. So spiders, wasps, some of the insects that people don't like, the bugs that people don't like, those are attracted to flowers. And then once they get brought in, they will go and continue to eat and harvest the pests of your vegetables. So it's a valuable plant to incorporate into a vegetable garden as well. In our area, Alstroemeria is considered a medium water use plant and it's classified as a perennial. So it's, it's meant for kind of the flower bed, sort of the cottage garden or a pollinator garden type of an aesthetic. It's good for borders. It's good to fill in gaps and it has a very soft look. There's no woody part to this plant. It flowers uh, starting in April and it will bloom all the way through September. So it has a nice long bloom season through the summer months, which is nice for us. There will be some hummingbirds that are attracted to this as well. And uh, people will grow this in containers, in pots. Uh, although anytime you have the tubers, I tend to be a little bit reluctant. I think I'd prefer to have them in the ground. Although uh, even for the floral industry, these can be grown hydroponically too. So without being placed in a pot or in soil at all, just planted in water and nutrients, uh, it's a good way to grow these. So they're very hardy, easy to care for. And in a California landscape, they're quite climate appropriate and they have a valuable role to play without any chance of becoming invasive in any way. So for all of these reasons, Alstroemeria aurea is a wonderful plant for us to study. This is Alstroemeria aurea Peruvian lily. And next up we have Anigoxanthos flavidus, the tall kangaroo paw. Just like Alstroemeria, this one oftentimes has many cultivars that people go with. Uh, for instance, Sunset is a popular one. And they don't worry about finding the traditional species, the wild species. Anigoxanthos flavidus is the tall kangaroo paw. You can see the image on the left-hand side showing the flowers as they grow four to even six feet tall. There are many other anigoxanthos many other kangaroo paws, and those are much less tall. But this is one of the straight species that is most common in our landscape. You see it in modern landscapes. It's a very popular plant to plant now because it's very climate appropriate, coming from Southwest Australia, which is the exact same climate as California, in particular, Southern California. It's uh, very tidy, does not drop or shed material. It does not grow too quickly and it doesn't really get thick. So you don't really have to trim it back too much. There can be some problems when you overwater it that this plant will attract some fungal diseases, leaf spot and things like that. So if you plant it in a zone that is watered with other low water use plants, you'll be just fine. Uh, this does perfectly fine on slopes, on hillsides. I see it on a lot of medians, parking strips, inside parking lots, little landscaped areas surrounded by sidewalk and concrete. This is a popular plant for including in the landscape for all of those reasons. In particular, on those medians and the driveway, 
This is nice because notice the flowers as they grow up tall, they provide some visual aesthetic, but you're not gonna block the view 100%. So if you planted this along a street or a driveway, you wouldn't be blocking the view of any cars coming in or out of the street. That's part of the reason you see these commonly planted in parking lots. Notice the image on the right-hand side and see how the flower, when it's not open, so the bud is covered in a velvety fine hairs that are red in color. So you end up with a bloom season that goes from red to yellow and a very long bloom season at that. And somewhere in there, these are said to look like or resemble a kangaroo's paw. But to be honest, I don't really know too well what a kangaroo's paw looks like. So I'll let someone else be the judge of that. Again, this plant uh, does fine in containers and will also attract hummingbirds like many of our others we've covered so far. As opposed to tubers underground, this plant has rhizomes, which are horizontal stems underground, and that allows the plant to come back after disturbance very easily. So say it was to be cut down to the ground, it would regrow. And in the case of its native habitat in Australia, that area is prone to fire, just like Southern California. And these rhizomes that will re-sprout when disturbance is felt above ground. That is one of the ways that this plant has adapted to fire. And it also is not very flammable in and of itself. So because of that, this is a perfectly fine fire-wise plant. It's good to plant in areas where you may be prone to wildfire in San Diego. All in all, this is a very hardy, very beautiful and very reliable plant. It's a good one for commercial landscapes. It's a popular plant in residential ornamental landscapes. And it kind of has a place almost anywhere in a California garden. You probably have room to fit a few of these in. This is a Nigoxanthus flavidus tall kangaroo paw. And now we have Cleviata, the natal lily. And like a few of our other plants, in particular from South Africa. This plant has a common name that's not so nice. So I'm not even worrying about teaching that to you. Natal lily is perfectly fine to say. It's the polite way to refer to this plant. And until very recently in the United States, we would uh, use the other name with no knowledge that it was connected to uh, prejudice, discrimination, or uh, really racism in South Africa. But my perspective is that if you know it, you need to act on it. So you may see other people use a different name. You may uh, see it in books, even United States kind of Western books with a different name. If you find that, pay no attention to it, but just know that uh, natal lily is what we call it, and it's the thing that you should tell other folks to call it too, if you hear anyone misspeaking. But again, a lot of people still just will say clivia, which is perfectly fine to say as well. Now here, this non-grass monocot has as well a stunning orange-red flower, and this comes from the amaryllis family which has a few uh, characteristics that are easy to recognize. Notice the, the grass-like or the blade-like leaves. They're quite wide and broad, deep green when they're in shade, and they have a very tropical look, just like the flowers do as well. Those flowers uh, have emerged a few weeks ago, and they'll flower through the late spring and early summer. And if they're in the proper location, they'll flower longer than that as well. You get this orange red cluster of flowers. Once they're pollinated, they'll give way to uh, a bright red 
fruit. And so there's virtually year round interest with this plant. Now, this one is prized with horticulturists. Notice the image on the right hand side, how it's up against a house and between a house and a sidewalk. So that's a perfect place for this plant because it, uh, it won't cause any problems to the house or to the sidewalk. It's not gonna crack anything or it's not gonna lift anything up. It'll stay in that spot. In particular, this plant is one of the few that likes dry shade. So there's a lot of plants that do well in the shade, but they need water. There's a lot of plants that do well in the dry, but they need sun. So dry shade, it's very hard to find any plants that do well in dry shade. But if you're in Southern California and you have a client that's got some dry shade, go for the clivia because that is going to be the most hardy plant in that environment. So because dry shade, this is good for understories. If you have tree canopies and you wanna plant things under your tree, but you wanna stay drought tolerant, these plants are great for that. And they certainly have a tropical effect. So in a plumeria garden or mixed in with some other tropical looking plants, you can get that kind of lush, deep green and bright, vibrant flower without needing to spend a lot of water on it. So this plant, the clivia, also has an underground stem uh, which is in the form of a rhizome that makes it very drought tolerant and quite hardy. And it's very popular in horticulture. So it's been in cultivation for a long time. There are many varieties out there with different names that come with different colors, variations to the flower and to the leaf. And there's a lot of different uh, groups even that have kind of focused on this plant and taking it to its uh, furthest extremes with specialty breeding in order to get rare and exotic, unique looking colors. In most places, in temperate parts of the world, it's typically a, a potted plant that would be brought indoors in the wintertime and uh, maybe in kind of a conservatory or a greenhouse, glass house type of a setting. But in Southern California, we grow it outdoors just fine. And uh, this one is a little bit poisonous, so you wouldn't want to eat it at all, even though when the flowers give way to the fruit, the fruit may look like something you'd want to try to eat, like a little berry or a little fruit. Don't do that. Every part of this plant is uh, mildly poisonous. So there we have Clivia miniata, natal lily. Next up, we've got another very common plant. This is daffodil, narcissus hybridum. Now here we have to discuss this scientific name. Uh, it's no longer acceptable to name a plant uh, like this. So hybridum is not a proper specific epithet, but it works because it is old. So daffodil uh, is a plant that's been studied for a long time, and even narcissus is the genus, but oftentimes the common name also, Narcissus, Daffodil. Here we put the cross to show it's a hybrid, um, but it's hard to trace these back sometimes because humans have been planting these for so long and they've been described in uh, academic literature for so long that some of them predate the conventions. So this is one example where here we'll, we'll call this Narcissus hybridum, and you won't get to call many other plants that because you wouldn't say that anymore. New plants aren't named that. It's not part of the rules, but here we break the rules. So at least it's easy to remember it's a hybrid because the specific epithet of hybridum, it also includes the cross. So you need to put the X or the cross and you need to say hybridum. But truthfully, it would be a hybrid between two other species that should have their own names, right? So this is a way that uh, it used to be referred to, still common, because our horticultural trade and the human usage of this plant has continued 
for so long. There are many forms of daffodils. Uh, the one on the left-hand side is pure yellow, and that's a very common uh, form of daffodil. And then we've got uh, the other on the right-hand side, the white with the golden color, the orange or yellow. And that's probably more true to the original uh, form. The one on the left is a more recent cultivar. These have a very broad range, native range, coming uh, all the way from basically uh, the Mediterranean, Middle East, through Afghanistan, China, and all the way into the Japanese islands. Daffodil, of course, is very popular as a cut flower. So our floral industry goes with uh, daffodil. And they've been designated as a very low water use plant in San Diego, which uh, personally I have a little bit of a doubt about, but I'm not gonna argue with the data. They call it a very low water use plant, meaning you don't need to water it at all. And part of the reason for that is this is a bulb. So this will completely disappear above ground and you won't even see it at all. And then this time of year in the spring is when it pops up and it shoots up the flowers and those flowers are very easy to pick and harvest. If you want to keep your daffodil year after year, you are welcome to pick all the flowers, but you should leave the leaves. Do not cut the leaves down to the ground. In fact, you want to wait until those leaves are totally dried up and desiccated on the surface. Wait till they turn brown because we need the leaves to continue producing sugar for as long as possible. And what do they do with that sugar? They send it straight down into the bulb. And the bulb is what survives over the winter in order to send up a future growth. So if you pick the flowers every year and then you come along and cut the leaves down to the ground when they just start to look bad, you're gonna kill your daffodils. It's much better to actually let the leaves persist. And a common practice, if you want them to get out of the way, if they look a little ugly, instead of cutting them, you just tie them all up in a little knot. So a lot of times with your bulb plants, instead of cutting them down, you just tie them and leave them there in the garden. And that allows them to dry up naturally and send all of their remaining energy, all of the sugar down into the bulb. And that will guarantee good perennial growth. They will come back year after year. Uh, the bulb itself is uh, toxic, so you wouldn't want to eat it, certainly. And that toxicity has been used with some success. Uh, I've had some success, so I can speak on it. The rest, I've just always heard from others, so I'm cautious about some of the garden myths that are out there. But I've had some success here with planting daffodils at the base of fruit trees and other shrubs that I want to protect from gophers because the gophers will oftentimes dig around and go after your roots and they can easily kill a fruit tree and the tree will look perfectly fine above ground and you won't even know until the tree falls over. You look and you see the roots have been eaten. So a traditional practice, an old, old practice is to put daffodils at the base of your trees when you plant your tree and that will protect the roots of the tree from being eaten by gophers and to this day if you go to old orchards orchards that have been planted uh, traditionally and so in san diego if you go up to julian and you may have to go later in the year because it's colder up in those mountains but you go look at the old apple orchards of julian not the commercial industrial apple orchards, the old kind of classic farm apple orchards, you'll find daffodils popping up. Even in empty fields, you'll find the daffodils popping up. And that's a clue that, hey, maybe this used to be an apple orchard once upon a time because somebody planted daffodils to keep the gophers away. The only reason I share that, other than it's a nice story, helps you to remember, is that it... Uh, I have had some success. So I can speak with some confidence. Did I do a scientific experiment where I compared a control and a variable? No, 
but I did plant them and I had gopher problems and those problems did not affect the tree that had the daffodils. So there you go. Uh, the flowers themselves are beautiful to look at. They're also very fragrant. They are uh, sweet smelling and they are excellent for including in a vase on the table to help freshen up a room or to bring some brightness in. So here we have daffodil, one of the most popular spring plants in temperate regions. Uh, very popular as cut flowers in the landscape, in public parks, and really a sign of spring to a lot of folks. This is it. We have Narcissus hybridum daffodil. And next up, we have Tolbagia violacea society garlic. Tolbagia violacea society garlic. Another South African native from the Amaryllis family. This is not related to a true garlic, although it does have a bit of a garlic fragrance. Some people find this plant to be particularly malodorous. Some people think it smells like a skunk or like some other uh, smelly plants, and others don't find it to be particularly smelly at all. So there's a bit of variation here on who likes this plant and who doesn't? I think everyone has slightly different senses of smells. But this is a very hardy plant, quite small, only about one foot tall, one foot wide when it's not in bloom. And notice those light purple flowers that come up. Those will be there for most of the year, and they're only about a foot taller. So they're very good in tight spaces between a sidewalk and a fence, for instance, or in a landscape, you can scatter them in the foreground and have them add some height and dimension to an otherwise ground cover uh, landscape in the very foreground without blocking the view of what's in the background. Traditionally, the leaves of this plant were eaten as sort of a substitute for chives or garlic and kind of like a, almost like a leafy vegetable although more of a seasoning than an actual salad plant. It has a strong flavor, so you would only put a little bit uh, for meat or potatoes or things like that. Uh, there were also medicinal uses uh, traditionally and to this day, although you do want to be cautious, of course, with any of these types of plants because when they have a strong smell, that's often an indicator. There's a lot of concentration of oils and volatile chemicals and those can have negative impacts on your particular body. And so if you're using plants for medicine or food, again, be very cautious. Do not uh, just assume this is a vegetable that is safe for everybody to eat. More than anything, it's planted and cultivated as an ornamental plant. In nature, this one follows fire. So often if a wildfire comes through, the smoke that's deposited and in present will help to encourage the new seeds to sprout and more importantly, to grow and be vigorous. So in the nursery industry, they will actually treat the seeds of this plant with smoke, liquid smoke, or even create a fire and let the smoke go around the plant. And it has been found that smoke will increase not only the color, the size, the number of flowers, but also just the general survivability of the plant. The plant survives much better when there's smoke, uh, when it was a seed. And so if you want to get into propagation, there's a lot of different uh, techniques you can explore to get into the finer details of how to preserve and grow some of these plants that we see in our landscape quite commonly. This one's very common in the commercial and the residential landscape. It's very hardy. Once it's in, it's low water use. It doesn't require much maintenance at all. You don't have to trim it. You don't have to worry about it. And it just stays there. So in a nice tidy little line or scattered about mixed with other low growing plants, this helps to fill in the gaps, fill in some space. And it's very tidy, very compact, 
and I think it's quite pleasant. I don't really get any of the negative uh, fragrance from it, although I've talked to many folks who do think it's a bit on the smelly side. So the next time you see it, stop and crunch some leaves between your fingers and give it a whiff, see what you think. So here we have Tolbagia violacea society garlic. And last but not least, we have Zantadeshia aethiopica calla lily. So calla lily is very common. A lot of people are familiar with at least the name calla lilies. The scientific name's a little tricky. Zentadeshia aethiopica. Notice this one too comes from South Africa. A lot of people would see that specific epithet and think it comes from Ethiopia, but no, it comes from South Africa. Although it has spread to many countries all over the world. What makes this uh, particularly easy to spread, in fact, this is a bit on the invasive side, is that in South Africa, this plant grows in wet areas. So the marshy, fresh water, little ponds and streams. This plant will even grow in pure water, standing water. But it often will grow on the banks and it can tolerate drought just fine as well. These cups, these flower cups are quite stunning and really like nothing else. So they're quite large and they form a beautiful white cup that uh, is easy to harvest, very ornamental, quite aesthetic. It's been depicted in many famous paintings by famous artists. And there's a lot of uh, sort of a romanticism and even imagine hanging out by a, a fountain or a pond and just gazing at the calla lilies as you enjoy uh, a summer day in the shade. Now, be careful with the common name here, calla lily. Do not confuse this with canna lily. There's also canna lily. That's not what this is. No relation. They're very different plants. So this is calla lily. If you do not see the flower, it can be a little bit difficult to identify. The way you figure it out is take a look at the leaves. Now, remember, these are monocots non-grass monocots, but here we have this quite uh, wide, broad leaf that looks very tropical and looks very, it doesn't look like a monocot. Notice the wavy margin on that leaf. Do you see that in the left and the right photos, the wavy margin? That's one of the key indicators that you've got a calla lily. Oftentimes, Nothing will be showing, and then this will pop up from the ground because uh, it'll come back after kind of disappearing. And you'll see the leaves only. And you don't know what it is? Well, it's calla lily. And you can tell if it's got a wavy margin to its large leaf. This is considered a moderate or medium water use plant in San Diego. In the state of California, this is on the watch list for it being an, an invasive species. So it's not recommended that you plant this plant. Although in Southern California, we don't find it escaping cultivation very often. In Northern California, like San Francisco in Golden Gate Park, you'll find it everywhere. And it clearly uh, can become a problem in wetlands next to streams or rivers or ponds. But if you have a garden and it's an urban garden surrounded by streets and sidewalks, and you're not close to any kind of waterways, natural canyons or open space, this plant is not gonna be a huge risk. And unfortunately, because of its invasiveness in California, uh, I wouldn't recommend that you plant this in a client's uh, house. I wouldn't recommend that you get paid to put this plant in. You shouldn't buy it in a nursery, for example. But if you happen to live at a place that already has calla lily, uh, I think it can be sustainably kept in place without becoming a problem. 
if you're if there's no real threat of it spreading over the fence. So if you've got it, enjoy it. I don't recommend you go out and plant more of it. Because of those big, beautiful leaves and the stunning flowers, this is certainly a plant for tropical effect. This is one that will give you great uh, cut flowers if you wanted to gather them together. There are many different cultivated varieties that have even different colors, not just white, but the traditional species just has the pure white. Like many of our other plants on this list, this one has tubers, which are uh, swollen portions of the stem that are underground. And what we see as the flower, which looks like a single large flower, botanically speaking, it's not a true flower. Uh, it, it's what we would call a false flower. And that very showy uh, white petal is technically a bract which we know from our other plants we've studied is a modified leaf that's usually colored to act like a petal. And in this case, that structure is referred to as a spath or a spath. In the center of that funnel-shaped spath, we have the central finger-like projection, and that's where the true flowers are contained. That yellow projection in the center is called the spadix. So we have spath and spadix instead of a true flower. The, flower, the true flowers themselves are very small and very inconspicuous. They're hard to even really see. And some may even say they're non-blooming flowers. They don't really open the way you would expect regular flowers to open. And so what most people consider to be the flower uh, we would call it that uh, false flower, a spath and spadix. So here we have the quite stunning, quite lovely, beautiful, uh, perfect for springtime, Xantodesia aethiopica calla lily. Well, there you go. I hope you enjoyed these next 10 plants on our list. These are things that you can see right now out in our San Diego landscapes. They should be in full bloom. They should be out there available for you to enjoy, available for you to enjoy over the spring holidays, as well as just in general, this uh, welcoming of warmer weather, of more sunshine, of uh, beautiful flowers just starting to emerge, and a lot of uh, exciting developments to come in the landscape of San Diego. So here we have list 2B. These are non-grass monocots and they are just the tip of the iceberg of what we can find out there. Thanks a lot.